Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Vic Walters, Johnny. Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding. Oh, hi, Nick. How's with you? Good and bad, Johnny. Good and bad. Well, I'm sure it's nothing good you've called me about. What's the problem? $58,000. <laughs> Lost, straight, or stolen? As if I didn't know. Yeah, probably stolen. Ever hear of the old Lang Zion Furniture Company? I have not. Sounds like a gag. It's no gag. Some of the finest traditional furniture in the world comes out of that plant. Really? It's up in northern Massachusetts in a little town north of Fitchburg, and it's run by a bunch of real characters. Oh, how do you mean? Well, I suggest that when you go up there, you wear a dark blue suit, white shirt, and black four-in-hand tie. Huh? Oh, and suspenders. Be sure you wear suspenders. Are you kidding? Why? Uh, why don't you come over here at the office and let me tell you about it? Yeah, Nick, I think I'd better. <laughs> Exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the two face matter. Expense account item one, after shaving, showering, and donning the most funereal clothes I could find. Item one, a dollar ten taxi to Nick Weldon's office at Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding. Uh, just remember what I told you, Johnny. The old Lang Syne Furniture Company is run by a bunch of characters. Yeah, that's what intrigues me. That's why I came over here. Oh, they're craftsmen, all right. The old school. May take them a couple of years to make an ordinary straight-back chair. But when it's done, it's the most beautiful thing you ever saw. And the finish they get on the pieces they turn out. Beautiful. And expensive, too, huh? Oh, sure, but worth it. Any piece of furniture they make will last 100, 500 years. Yeah, the real honest craftsman, the kind you don't see anymore. Uh-huh. Well, apparently somebody wasn't too honest with them. So tell me all, Nick. Johnny, it seems one of their lads has run off with some of the company money. Yeah, you mentioned 58,000 bucks. Yep. 58,433 to be exact, and those boys are exact. Well, what did the police have to say? Nothing. They were never called in. Well, why not? I told you, the place is run by a flock of real characters. Oh, brother, they must be. When did this happen? Sometime within the past three and a half years. And you've just found out about it now? That's right. Well, how come? I told you, John. Yeah, that... that's right, you told me. There are a bunch of characters. But didn't their policy state that any claim had to be filed within 60 days of the loss? Oh, we waived that for them. Struck it from the policy. Why? Because they don't like to be rushed in anything. Rushed? After all, 60 days. And don't forget, they only discovered the loss a bit over a month ago. They even took a month to let you know about it. Yeah. And yet you say it could have occurred as much as three and a half years ago. Yeah, 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 I know. But uh, why don't you save the questions for Mr. J. Worthington Keasley? Who's he? Yeah, the senior member of the organization, I guess you'd call him. There, there are no officers, you know. President, vice president, and so on. You mean a company big enough to suffer a cash loss of $58,000? Johnny, I told oh, you. Oh, yeah, I... yeah, that's right, you told me. Yeah. So, will you go up there and see what's what? <laughs> Nick, I'm going up there for just one reason, on expense account, of course. Oh, uh, of course. And that is to take a good look at these crazy characters you've been telling me about. <laughs> Item two... 325 for a bus to Fitchburg, Massachusetts, where at the terminal I picked up a local to North Weldon, home of the old Lang Syne Furniture Company. The name was appropriate. Located on the outskirts of the quiet little New England town, it consisted of a huge barn-like building that looked as though it had been standing there since the year one. Surrounded by stately elm trees and a couple of gnarled ancient oaks, it looked, well, very picturesque. A large wrought iron weathercock raced one end of the high peak shingle roof and looked down on broad lawns and well kept flower beds. The road leading up to it was just an old fashioned dirt road, and I kicked the dust as I plodded along. Then suddenly I stopped. 
For there at the side, instead of automobiles, were, believe it or not, horses. Horses and carriages and a bicycle or two or three. It was almost as though a picture of 50 or 60 years ago had suddenly come to life. And then inside, when I found Mr. J. Worthington Keesley, well, he looked like one of the Smith brothers. And sitting in front of a fine but ancient roll-top desk. Of course we do, Mr. Dollar. Our fathers and their fathers before them all wore full beards. Therefore, we do, too. Would you like a bit of snuff, sir? No. Uh, no, thanks. Yes, it's one of the traditions, sir. The traditions to which we adhere in order that we may continue to fabricate the superlative furniture for which we've become famous over the past 107 years. And I take it, Mr. Keesley, that the same thing applies to the horses and carriages out there at the side? Yes. They were good enough for our grandparents, so they're good enough for us. Uh, I suppose that's why I should have suspected Mr. Twiller. Mr. Twiller? Roscoe James Twiller, Mr. Dollar. Uh, here, sir, is a picture of him. In this group photograph taken on the occasion of our 100th anniversary. <laughs> I feel like I ought to yell beaver. I'm afraid his mighty shock of hair and magnificent beard misled me back in 1941 when I hired him. Yes, and I suppose I should have known when he gave up horse and Surrey to drive one of those newfangled motor cars. Should have known what, Mr. Keesley? That he was no longer a man suited to our fine establishment. Is he the one who took off with your $58,000? $58,433.41. Are you sure? I mean, sure it was he? Beyond the shadow of a doubt, sir. He was the only one beside myself who had a key to the vault in which we kept our building fund. And when he suddenly left us three years, five months, and 16 days ago, yes, yes, I should have known. But you didn't discover the loss until recently. It was June 21st at four minutes after 10 that I went down to the vault. For the first time in four years, we had something extra to put aside. And you discovered the money was missing. The vault was empty. Except for this note. Huh? Goodbye, suckers. Horrid word. Signed, Tuller. So, you see, Mr. Dollop. Yes, yes, I do. It looks like he's our man. No question about it. And you've no idea where he might have gone? None whatsoever. Well, surely there must be some clue. None whatsoever. But you must find him. But that was three and a half years ago. Exactly three years, five uh, months, yeah, and sixteen. Yeah. So where do I start? Unless your company decides simply to reimburse us for our loss, that, Mr. Dollar, is up to you. Johnny Dollar in a moment. Sometimes we may wonder why a football team doesn't quit playing and walk off the field when it finds itself 50 points behind with only a few minutes of play to go. What is that indomitable spirit that fills men with hope and keeps them going in spite of terrific odds, keeps them going just to play the game according to the rules, just to get the job done as well as they know how? This kind of spirit pervaded the feelings of heavy bomber crews of the 9th Air Force on that day of glory, August 1st, 1943, the day of one of the most secretly planned surprise bombing missions of World War II, the day of the low-level attack on the Romanian oil refineries at Ploesti. More than 170 B-24 heavily loaded bombers took off in a swirl of red dust from Benghazi, Libya, to bomb a highly defended priority target. The element of surprise in the low-level attack was to be one of their greatest weapons. But things went wrong from the start. Three planes exploded during takeoff operations. Eleven more aborted due to engine trouble. Of those that reached the target area, less than one-third returned to home base. The leaders of the mission encountered navigation difficulties and difficulty in identifying specific targets. And due to the loss of that elemental hope, surprise, they also encountered devastating enemy firepower from flak and fighters. The mission was partially successful, but a horrifying experience. Five medals of honor were awarded to the heroes of the Ploesti Raid for valorous action above and beyond the call of duty. 
At any time, the men would have been justified in turning back. But they had a code of conduct that made them want to see the unequal game through to the end. It was a job that had to be done. A charge of the light brigade in the air as they flew down the valley of death to glory. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Two-Faced Matter. Okay, Mr. Keesley, it looks like this man, Twiller, is the one who walked off with the money in your safe when he left your employ. No question about it. And unless you can find him, your company will have to pay the full amount of the loss. Yeah, well, even if I do find him, the chances are he'll have spent that money. After all, three years and a half. Exactly three years, five months, and... Um, you say you have no idea whatsoever as to where he might have gone. With that much money, he could be anywhere in the world. Uh-huh. Where did he live? I don't know, sir. You... What? After all, it was none of my affair. But if he worked for you a number of years... You... I make it a rule never to pry into the affairs of others. Except, of course, for the manufacture of fine furniture is concerned. Well, doesn't anybody in this organization know anything about Twiller? Possibly Mr. Bottomley. Who is he? He is presently engaged in creating a heppelfite table in the shop. Come, we shall speak with him. The huge shop dated back a hundred years at least. There wasn't a single power tool, not even a buzzsaw. But some of the tools looked as though they might have been used to build the ark. Eight or ten men, all of them old, all wearing dark trousers, suspenders, and white aprons, were busy turning out fine pieces of furniture, carefully, almost lovingly. And every one of them wore his own distinctive full beard. <laughs> Hooray for tradition. Mr. Keesley led the way to a man who was gently trimming the edge of some kind of a sideboard. Good morning, Mr. Bottomley. Good morning, Mr. Keesley. You must pardon this intrusion, Mr. Bottomley. It must be for good reason, Mr. Keesley. Though you must understand that I cannot afford interruption if I am to finish this credenza by the foot of the year coming. Of course. I wish you to meet Mr. Johnny Dollar. Good morning, Mr. Dollar. How are you? He is an investigator, Mr. Bottomley. Come to get us back the money we lost. Then he must find Mr. Twiller. Exactly. Good morning, Mr. Thurston. Good morning, Mr. Keesley. Mr. Keesley tells me you know where this man Twiller lived. He was my neighbor. Lived alone next door to me. Where? And I assure you, sir, I had no idea of his designs on the company building fund. Yes, I'm sure. But now if you tell... Each morning, he drove me to work in his carriage until he purchased that abominable motor car. Oh? I refused to ride in it, sir. And bought myself a bicycle. You did properly, Mr. Bottomley. Good morning, Mr. Woodstone. Morning, Miss Keeley. Well, just where is it that Twiller lives, Mr. Bottomley? In the village of North Weldon. East North Weldon. On Peach Avenue. Well, then perhaps the authorities there will be able to give me some kind of a lead. The authorities? Yes, Mr. The police, Mr. Keeley. The police? Good heavens. I hope not, Mr. Dollar. Surely not the police. Gentlemen, 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 please. These gentlemen are right, the Dollar. Think of the blot on our good name. Now, look, your loss amounts to $58,000. $58,400. If I don't find this man, my company's going to have to pay off. I know, but the police... Now, look, my immediate job is to find this Roscoe James Twiller. And if I need the help of the police to do it... Who's the chief of police in North Weldon? Well, uh, the, uh, the mayor, Mr. Dollar. What's his name? John Kenworthy Wilkins, Mr. Dollar. Any of you know him? We do not mix with the townspeople, Mr. Dollar. We don't even go into town, Mr. Dollar. But I do have a picture of the mayor. Here, sir. Bottomley. Where did you get this? Uh, he's he's running for re-election, Mr. Keesley. I found this this poster in my carriage. Well, get rid of it, man. This is uh, indecent. No, no, wait a minute. Let me see that. Terrible. Disgusting. Huh? Why, it's a disgrace to have such a thing within the world of a fine old company. <laughs> oh, no. No wonder the old boys were shocked. For his honor, the mayor of North and East North Weldon was not only as bald as a billiard ball, but to top it off was clean-shaven. Yeah, 
A picture like this within the walls of the All Lang Syne Furniture Company was real sacrilege. But I still hadn't done my job. I had to find this man Triller or let the company pay out 58000 bucks. How to find him? I hadn't the least idea. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Times have changed, and so has the man. During the 18th and 19th centuries, warfare with its musket fire and cavalry charges and cannonades was a simple, direct, easily understood type of conflict. The undisciplined but sharp-eyed revolutionaries hid behind trees and hedgerows to pick off the advancing British troops. The wild, dashing, hell-for-leather cavalry charges of the Civil War and Custer's encounter with Sitting Bull and the Sioux Indians were, though courageous, simple, and direct. But they were far removed from the development of the atomic age, which demands selectivity, skill, and rigorous training. Until recently, the soldier's general level of knowledge determined his job suitability. Today, however, with more and more complex weapons and equipment being used, the military needs large numbers of skilled technicians. To that end, tests have been developed to find men with intelligence and technical aptitude and to develop in these men the needs of the future. Yes, times have changed, and so has the man. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Two-Faced Matter. <laughs> I found the mayor of North Weldon sitting comfortably on the shaded porch of his home, fanning himself with an election placard, and sipping at what looked suspiciously like a gin and tonic. If uh, you're certain that I can't fetch you a uh, <coughs> limeade, too, Mr. Dollar? No, no thanks, Mayor Wilkins. Yes. Well, now, as I started to say, when I first came here, I did hear something, some rumor about money having been taken from the old Lang Syne Furniture Company. But until they lodge a complaint with me, uh, we see I'm also chief of police. Yes, well, uh, the one I can see, they're pretty slow about things like that. Yeah, they're, they're slow about everything. But they make magnificent furniture. Mm -hmm, I could see that. Tell me, did you know this Roscoe Twiller at all? No, uh, gone before I came to North Weldon. Oh? But well, that was only three and a half years ago. And I came after that. Yet you're the mayor of the town. Uh, village, really, Mr. Dollar. But lovely place. It, I've always... Uh, I've liked it ever since the first time I saw it. And when the people learned of my police record... Huh? Uh, <laughs> my, my record in police work out in Ohio, why, they insisted that I take over my present job for oh, them. I see. And you have no idea where I could get a lead on this man Twiller. No. No. Sorry. The, uh... Don't the uh, people at the furniture factory have any ideas about him? None whatsoever. You're sure? I'm sure. Yes. Well, if what you've told me is true about his getting the money, I mean, he is probably far, far away. Yep, I'm afraid so. Just as far as I am from solving this case. <laughs> Well, we chatted on for a few minutes, and then I left him in the hope of finding some erstwhile neighbor who might be able to give me some help. I headed across town toward Peach Avenue. And then, as I was about to pass the bus stop... Bang! Bang! Huh? Bang! Bang! You're dead! Oh. And another redskin bit the dust. Well, hi there, fella. Cowboy, huh? Sure, I'm a cowboy and a policeman and an artist and everything. Sure. My name's uh, Jimmy Carter. What's yours? Johnny, darling. Want to see some of my artistical drawings? Yeah, sure, sure I do, Jimmy. Just look at this cigarette advertisement here on the fence. Uh -huh. With my own crayons, too. Okay. How's that? <laughs> Jimmy, that's the most beautiful mustache I ever saw on any girl. Sure. My teacher says I'm going to grow up and be a great artist. Oh, sure. But first I have to get a paint set. Sure, sure you do. And you see what I've done with this one? Sure, you... Jimmy. That's our mayor. Yeah. He's I... running for re-election. That's why he has all these signs all around. Don't you think he looks a lot better with some hair on his old bald head? 
And a little child shall leave it. Now I'm going to put a beard on it. <laughs> like, like some of those old men at the furniture factory. Stay with us, Jimmy. Stay with us. Ah, there are plenty of old men. Like this. Uh-huh. Only they never come in town. Never. There. Doesn't that look like one of them? There. Jimmy, that's so good, I'm going to say that. Really? Yes, sir. Thanks a lot. Jimmy? I sure do. I didn't know I was that good. Jimmy, you'll never know how good you are. so soon, Mr. Dollar? Mayor Wilkins, or rather, Chief Wilkins. Yeah? I have to ask you to make an arrest. You, you, uh, mean you've uh, found the man that you've been looking for? If there's any question about it, I'll make a civilian arrest. Oh, well, I, I, I don't understand, sir. Only a few minutes ago... Only a few minutes ago, I was blind as a bat to the most obvious possibility in the world. You showed up in this town a short time after Roscoe Twiller left. Yes, that's true. Roscoe Twiller, with a heavy shock of hair and a thick beard. Well, if I understand, it's all men out at the old Lang Syne furniture. You, clean-shaven, completely bald. Mr. Dollar. I should have realized by the funny pink tint on the top of your noggin that you've been using some kind of hair remover. I beg your pardon, sir. Here. Look at yourself. Yes. Where'd you get that? Roscoe James Twiller, alias John Kenworthy Wilkins. Now, now, Mr. Darling... And I'll bet that if I make a search of your house, I'll find the key to that vault in the furniture factory. No, I threw it away. I, I... Yeah. Do you want to make the arrest yourself, Twiller? Or shall I? I don't know why Twiller gave up so easily. I guess it was because I'd caught him completely off guard. He even signed a confession and promised to pay back what he could. So, from here on in, it's up to the courts. And all thanks to a little kid who liked to draw mustaches on billboards. Expense account total, including the finest paint set I could find for my little pal Jimmy. Ooh, hey, wait, I gotta pad this. It only comes out to $9.80. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Bob Bailey originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Will Wright, Herb Vigran, Boris Lewis, Edgar Barrier, Richard Beale, Bill James, and Gus Bays. Be sure to join us, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking.